All right, we're going to get started. It's uh, about 20 minutes after we're supposed to start, but that's all right. I'm David Pine. I'll be a convener for this session eight, uh, Sustainable MAR Technical Solutions. And our first speaker will be Doug Bartlett. And Doug is going to be talking to us on the comprehensive guidelines for managed aquifer recharge to be published by AS, American Society of Civil Engineers and EWRI. Um, Doug, you got 15 minutes, and then I'll ring the little bell, okay? okay. Or something like that. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. My name's Doug Bartlett. I'm from Scottsdale, Arizona. And today I'm representing the Environmental and Water Resources Institute of the American Society of Civil Engineers. And uh, first of all, I just want to uh, congratulate Enrique. I don't know where he is, but uh, congratulations, Enrique. I've been in your shoes before. As Peter said, it's a, it's a, uh, this is a family, and you've done a great job of uh, welcoming us to Madrid. And um, I know what a difficult job it is you've got, so thank you. So uh, I'm going to talk today about, for the very last time, I'm going to give an update on the guidelines for this ASCE uh, guidance document that me and my colleagues at ASCE have been preparing for the last 15 years, which is an embarrassingly long period of time. But um, let's see, I have. So just a little history. In 2001, ASCE published a standard guidelines for artificial recharge. It was called document 34-01. In 2005, a committee was organized to review that standard and propose changes and updates to it. In 2012, our committee decided to withdraw 3401 and develop a completely new standard guideline. In 2019, this year, uh, we've completed the public balloting process and it's now being designated as publication number 69-19. And uh, this fall, I'm proud to say, we're finally gonna actually get this thing published and you'll be able to have it uh, yourself. So why are guidelines needed? Well, they the, a guideline will provide information, um, a whole variety of information to entities new to uh, MAR projects in particular, and it provides a consistent process for all the steps in, in developing a MAR project, and it alerts uh, MAR developers of any kind of potential problems they could face and provide some solutions to those problems before they become a problem. So our committee is comprised of a whole bunch of different people from different uh, entities, uh, mostly in the western United States, um, just because that's where we all live. <laughs> so this has a slant a little bit to the western U.S., but um, I will say that uh, I was very happy that Dr. Pine was able to uh, uh, spent some time reviewing the document and um, provided good guidance and input to it as well. So uh, individual sections were independently developed by different subgroups within our larger group. Um, each section was balloted uh, by the entire committee as they were completed. Um, and the sections were either um, revised or reballoted until they passed or were withdrawn. The public comment period, as I mentioned, was just this year from February to March of 2019. I just received word yesterday that we have one final ballot to do on this document, and then it will become uh, final. Um, and then the uh, uh, ASCE's Codes and Standards Committee has to approve the document before it's actually published. So this is the old document, 3401, and this is the new one, uh, which will be published this year. So the final result is a, uh, a full range of scope of work for MAR projects. And we've included a number of case studies, which I'm gonna go over here in just a minute, uh, for, uh, several of them, I'll select a few. But uh, let's make no mistake about it, this is not the great American novel. Nobody's gonna read this thing from cover to cover. <laughs> it's a guidance document. So if you are uh, new to MAR, if you're a member of the general public and you don't understand anything about it, you might be interested in the first three chapters there. Um, if you are an operator of an existing MAR project, you might be more interested in, say, chapter seven, which is the operations and maintenance section. So these are designed to be independently read 
you don't have to read the whole document to, to get what you need out of it. And then the appendices are provided uh, with a lot of other information that uh, may be of use. So all of these sections were approved by ballot. Uh, this is the, the how it flows. Um, and so each chapter represents kind of a key stage, starting with chapter four, planning and evaluation, chapter five, design, chapter six, construction, chapter seven, operation and maintenance, and finally, closure in chapter eight. Chapter nine is really involved in all phases of a MAR project. It is the uh, data collection and analysis, um, which uh, is important to every stage of the, of the project. So looking at chapter four, you have the initial project scoping, where you define the objectives, a super critical part of uh, designing a MAR project. Then you go into the uh, data evaluation uh, for various things like hydrogeology, environmental, regulatory, et cetera. Um, then you would identify potential sites, go through a, a screening process, a feasibility study, um, and produce various documents related to that process. In chapter five, this is the design phase. There's the conceptual and preliminary final designs uh, that are done. And then depending on whether it's a surface facility or a subsurface facility, there's different uh, check boxes that you need to, to hit um, for each one and they're listed there for, uh, for both. Finally, there's a pilot phase, uh, pilot testing phase, and then the design documents. In chapter six under construction, Again, you have site preparation and uh, slight differences between surface and subsurface facilities, whether you're excavating and grading in, 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 uh, with regard to a surface facility or drilling and well construction with regard to subsurface facilities. Then for both, you've got electrical and SCADA system design, water treatment facilities, monitoring equipment, and construction records. Finally, in chapter seven, this is the uh, operation and maintenance. You have a startup and training. Uh, for surface facilities, you've got operational data and analysis, you've got issues that affect MAR operations, um, undesirable health effects, et cetera. Uh, and then under subsurface facilities, uh, clogging is a significant issue and needs to be addressed. So there's the discussion about the various problems that occur for, for both of those. Then water quality monitoring is, of course, uh, critical for both types of facilities. So in our appendices, we include a glossary of terms, notations, and symbols. Then we've selected various MAR regulations in the United States where you have a description of these various states as well as the federal regulations, and then the case studies. So with regard to our case studies, we have six for surface spreading facilities, and I'm gonna discuss just a, a couple of these um, today briefly. Uh, first one is a small one, Bear Canyon recharge project out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, in this case, they use bank filter, filtered surface water and discharge it into an arroyo channel during winter months. It infiltrates through a 150 meter veto zone. It, this is permitted for up to 3.7 million cubic meters per year. A uh, demonstration project was required. Full scale operations began in 2014 and they will operate this every other year, mainly to save costs for monitoring and reporting. And for each of these uh, case studies, we include a, a, the biggest challenge uh, that each one faced, and they vary from project to project, just to give you a kind of an idea of what were the issues that were difficult for the planners. In this case, it was navigating these uh, New Mexico regulations because this was the very first project of its type in Arizona, I mean in New Mexico, sorry. Orange County uh, Water District has a service uh, recharge facilities. Greg Woodside yesterday talked a little bit about this in his talk, so I won't uh, address this too much. Um, but this is a very old, uh, old facility, started in 1936, uh, covers uh, 600 he hectares. It has quite a few facilities with it, 21 full-time staff, and the biggest challenge is, is finding qualified staff for the various skills that they need to operate this facility. In Tucson, Tucson, Arizona, uh, the Southern Avra Valley Storage and Recovery Project is uh, really key. This is one of two projects that allow the recharge of Colorado River water. In this case, uh, 177 million cubic meters per year. And um, it recharges uh, 92 maximum 
and then recover 59, which is the maximum that the equipment they have right now is capable of. Um, it was completed in 2008 at a cost of $73 million. It covers 96 hectares and has 32 production wells. Um, the biggest challenge here is nitrate flushing because it is former agricultural lands. For well recharge, we have uh, six uh, examples uh, listed here. Um, just to cover a couple, in Orange County, the Talbert Gap seawater intrusion barrier is a pretty large old facility with 36 injection wells. In this case, the Newport Inglewood Fault Zone protects Orange County groundwater basin from encrosion, uh, in, in, intrusion of um, seawater. And except for gaps that are formed, in this case, one by the Santa Ana River. So um, this was noticed quite a while ago, and the, uh, the Talbert barrier of 36 recharge wells was constructed in the mid-1970s. Surface water at that time was recycled water, imported water, and this amber-colored deep groundwater. They had huge problems with clogging. So in 2008, they switched to 100% recycled water where they treated it with microfiltration, RO, and advanced oxidation. Uh, the barrier capacity is 28 to 50 million cubic meters per year, um, and they use regular back flushing and well redevelopment to maintain that capacity. F City of Phoenix Well 299 is unique in that it uses this reverse siphon injection method, um, and it has no downhole control valve uh, because of the reverse siphon approach. So just to give you a little general idea of how it works, the pump in the well is started. It purges the column pipe of loose particles and 167 meters of air in the pipe. When the water clears, a recharge valve is opened, which allows flow from the distribution system to the wellhead. So while the pump is still running, the distribution water is forced to pump to a waste pump to waste line uh, where it's discharged um, and this mixes with the pumped groundwater. With the recharge valve fully open, the pump shuts off. Most of the flow begins to recharge with some going to the pump to waste line. Finally, they close the recharge valve, which stops flow out of the pump to waste tank. And this has been success successfully operated since 2010. And the final uh, case study I've got is from Beaverton, Oregon. Um, and actually, Larry Eaton is in the audience here and knows a lot more about this than I do. But uh, uh, this uh, is unique in that it's in uh, flood basalt flows, which use, uh, uh, take advantage of these inner beds uh, between the flows. You can see those light blue colored areas are the uh, zones that they use to store water and recover it. There are three ASR wells completed in the 2001 and 2005 time period. It uh, recharges uh, greater than 1.9 million cubic meters per year and recover 6.9 cubic meter, million cubic, that should be million cubic meters per year. No, I think it's million. <laughs> uh, Larry can correct me. Uh, it employs a stacked ASR system that can store up to 1.7 million cubic meters annually. Um, the three wells can provide 30,500 cubic meters per day peaking capacity, which is about 35% of the city's summer peak day demand. But the challenges included with this were that it's in a highly urbanized area, so it has limited access and it required a lot of public outreach uh, to keep, make sure that the neighborhood wasn't too uh, disturbed by all the drilling and construction. So this uh, is the document coming very soon this year. I'm proud to say, and I'm proud that I will not be talking about this in the future. Maybe next time I'll be able to talk about something technical instead of a document. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. We have a couple more minutes here. Uh, any questions from the audience? I see one in the back here. And another one over here, two questions. I think I need to clean my glasses. Oh, everything's a glare. <laughs> Hi, Doug. Uh, Dennis Gonzalez from CSIRO in Australia. Thanks very much for the presentation. Um, I was just wondering whether the recommended Monitoring and treatment uh, is in the in the guidelines uh, commensurate with the risk associated with the end use. Uh, we have tried to uh, incorporate that into the document. Um, 
obviously there's uh, quite a variety of potential risks associated with these depending on the site. So it's a little hard to be too um, specific uh, in, a, in a guidance document, but uh, we have done the best we can in that area. I saw a second hand up there somewhere recently. Nope. Okay. Uh, Jordan Clark from UC Santa Barbara. Doug, you had a chapter on site closure. How many MAR sites have been closed? <laughs> it's a very short chapter, Jordan. <laughs> Not many. Uh, and I think what we've tried to do is uh, anticipate what closure would be like, you know, at some point when these get closed. But there really aren't very many, and maybe you know better than I. I, I. I'm not aware of too many that have been closed because they're still relatively new and very important usually to a community's water supply system. So they, they don't tend to close. They tend to change over time, but not close. Okay. Well, let's thank you, Doug. Appreciate it very much.